डॉक्टर यशवंत राव इज अ प्रोफेसर एंड हेड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ पीडियाट्रिक्स जीएसपी मेडिकल कॉलेज कानपुर मोर देन थर्टी पब्लिकेशन नेशनल इंटरनेशनल जर्नल डूइंग टू प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ आई एस एम आर एंड प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ आर एन टी सी पी एंड मेजर वर्क एरिया ऑफ विटामिन डी and he is a very renowned figure of academy of pediatrics uttar pradesh and a very passionate teacher and is involved in several reforms in his medical college for the benefit of the newborn care and he runs a extremely extremely efficient and uh, very well functioning uh, nic unit at gsm kanpur thank you sir dr sunil rao he is the professor at the department pediatrics i uh, institute of medical sciences dhu varanasi and he is in charge of the intensive care and pulmonology is mbbs 2005 and md 2008 from ss medical college riva he has more than 50 publications in international journals and he has also three projects running with him he is also a very passionate teacher and i think our chair person will contribute a lot to what dr jayashankar kaushik is going to add and i am to i now hand over the session to our honorable chair persons and uh, i request dr sun kumar rao to please introduce our expert speaker thank you dr sala for nice words at the outset i am honored to introduce dr jay shankar kaushik he is a pediatric neurologist and currently working as a additional professor and head pediatric department of pediatrics teams guwahati if i read through his, his bio data he, he has more than 85 publications in various scientific journals Ten written chapters in various books, awarded by Bal Gopal Raju Environment Award in Child Health, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, 2008, and currently editorial board member of editorial board in Indian Pediatrics, national journal, one of the renowned journal in pediatrics from India, and also treasurer of Association of Child Neurology India. Apart apart from that, that he is one of the experienced experienced person. Uh, and right person to deliver talk on the neurological examination in pediatric population or in children for post graduates because we 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 have we found more of the interested or more of the deepest part of the this examination tools which helps to categorize and and help to and uh, to identify the inverted investigations for making a further diagnosis and management plan so with these words i will welcome dr jay shankar kaushik to deliver talk on neurological examination part 1 dr jay shankar please dr yashwant will you like to say something before dr jay shankar starts i think sir uh, we should continue yeah um good afternoon uh, all and uh, i immensely thank you for giving this opportunity and i uh, thank aop uh, up chapter as well as the respected chairperson for this opportunity um hope my voice is clear and uh, the slides are moving yes yeah yes okay okay so today uh, good uh, good afternoon students so today we will be discussing on examination of central nervous system uh, we have divided this into part 1 and part 2 uh, primarily we are trying to uh, uh, cover higher mental functions and cranial nerve in part 1 and we will be discussing the motor system sensory system meningeal signs and other parts of uh, neurological examination in the part 2 part of it so the main learning objective of this session is to get familiar with the terms that are used in higher mental function and to perform cranial nerve examination and this is also to help residents present higher mental function and cranial nerve examination findings in their exam or while uh evaluating the cases per se um so the main purpose of the neurological examination uh that every student should remember is that neurological examination is just not a long list of maneuvers it's actually a logical and it is interconnected and it is very interesting to solve the puzzle rather every part is going to give you a lot of clue and there is nothing that can actually replace neurological examination and rather every investigation and every uh, 
every part of the history needs to be correlated with the examination findings and in children it is very difficult to probably remember as to what all parts of neurological examination we are supposed to do so uh, it's very very important to do neurological examination in a um, systematic kind of manner so let us start with higher mental function i have tried to simplify it this is just a kind of a simplification by which you are you will be able to little remember the headings under which the higher mental function needs to be discussed so you can remember that higher mental function have mental status examination and higher mental function examination mental status examination per se will include a b c d e appearance behavior communication delusion and hallucinations and emotion whereas higher mental functions is going to include coma pifac coma pifac consciousness orientation memory abstract thought attention span spatial perception insight calculation released reflexes and other functions so the most important thing to remember is that this list if you try to remember you will probably not forget any part of higher mental function but this is just a mnemonic to you know remember this is not the sequence in which you are supposed to do higher mental function examination because the state functions we call these consciousness attention span mood all of them to be called as a state function so that means the child has to be really very cooperative to examination the child should be conscious the child should have a good attention span before you test for memory abstract thought and other parts of it so state functions are usually tested before your testing for the channel function so although by mnemonic probably you will remember that consciousness orientation memory abstract but without testing attention span it might be a little difficult to interpret memory so many of the students often interpret by saying that the memory is impaired when actually the main problem is impaired attention span not impaired memory per se so it's very important to remember that higher mental functions can be very easily remembered by using this kind of a mnemonic of appearance behavior communication delusion hallucination a b c d e this is mental status examination and higher mental function examination which includes consciousness orientation memory abstract thought attention span perception insight and calculations so let us start all of them one by one so the first thing is appearance and behavior so once the child walks in you look at the child how cleanliness the child has maintained how is the facial expression is the child maintaining eye, any eye contact or not is the child showing some interest in the surrounding is the child showing some kind of interest in the opd is he cooperative to the examination how is the behavior is there any aggression is he trying to break things that are there in your opd so is there any disruptive behavior or do you think he is just running around at one point of time so is there an hyperactive behavior or not so the first and foremost thing that you need to comment on a mental status examination is appearance and behavior so in appearance you look at general uh, appearance of the child so a child with intellectual disability or a child with you know global developmental delay or a child with lot of uh, behavioral issues might be a little unkept the child might the mother would have dressed the child very well but by the time he comes to the opd all the hair is totally gone and you know he has soiled everything per se so these is the first thing that you note on appearance and behavior the second part is communication so we need to remember that communication per se includes two important thing and the student should be able to understand that language per se is suppose i have something in my mind and i am trying to convey that idea to you that's a language so if i am using the word that is the speech that is coming out so it is the verbal output that is coming out that's a speech which is there so it's very very important to understand that language is a cortical function speech is also a very very important part and speech is just the part of the language which is there and speech per se will indicate that the speech uh, Uh, is an integral part of language so communication can include both verbal communication as well as non verbal communication so i can communicate with the words or i can even communicate with the gesture so if i say this kind of a gesture to the child the child knows that he is making fun of me so 
these are called as non verbal gestures which can also convey the language per se so student should be a little familiar with uh, the common terms that are used in the language uh, one of the very common term that's used is dysarthria whenever there is a problem in articulation it's a dysarthria articulation usually happens at the level of the larynx all right so if the articulation that is happening at the level of the labials linguals and gutturals if there is a problem this is a disorder of articulation which results in dysarthria if the speech melody is getting affected that's a dysprosody if the child is unable to choose the words in unable to find out words to convey the meaning or the child has difficulty in language that's an aphasia if the child has inability to read then it's alexia if there is a disturbance in writing we use it as a agraphia luckily we don't see so many problems in pediatric neurology but we at least tend to see more of dysarthria that is disorder of articulation so there are seven components of language when you try to see the first is articulation second is fluency the third is comprehension fourth is naming of the object the fifth is repetition sixth is reading and seventh is writing so these are seven components of language that we tend to see so when you look at the spontaneous speech you note the speech output is the speech dysarthric or dysprosodic fluency per se means that how many words the child is able to speak within one particular time frame so that means if i ask the child to tell me the names of the animal that you know and you count in one minute how many animals he is able to tell that's fluency so fluency per se basically indicates the number of words that the child is able to speak within one time frame per se articulation is how the child is articulating the words to convey that meaning the articulation usually happens at the level of lips that's called labials at the level of the tongue that's linguals at the level of the throat back of the throat that's guttural so when you try to speak per p p p p try to speak p p p you can see that labials lips are moving when you try to say th 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 try speaking th it's lingual you can see that the tongue is moving try to say kh 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 that's guttural that's like back of the throat that is coming so that means there has to be a coordination between labials linguals and guttural for the articulation to come out very very well and one of the very easy way to remember this is pataka that is a cracker in diwali so when you ask the child to say p p p th 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 kh 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 if the child is able to say p p p th 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 kh 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 very well articulation is very well preserved in that particular child but trust me the children in less than 7 years it is very difficult to do the only thing that you can convey is that is the speech vocabulary appropriate for that age or not and is the speech intelligible or not so these are the two things that we try to comment on the next part of the language after you have tested the art fluency and the articulation is comprehension so you give a very very comprehension means is the child able to understand or comprehend what you are trying to say so if i ask the child to point to the door the child points to the door if i ask the child to touch your nose the child is touching your nose so then you know that these are single steps single one step command the child is able to do you can also give once the child is able to do this single step command then you can say that touch your nose and then point to the floor so if the child is able to do two step command then you give three step command so this is how you try to look for uh, auditory comprehension in addition if the child is able to do very well auditory comprehension you can also try for semantic comprehension in which you ask the child where is the light can you point to the light in this room so the child understands that this is the bulb from where the light is coming so the child points to the source of illumination so that indicates semantic comprehension semantic means you are able to understand the meaning of what you are trying to say so this is what is comprehension per se so in children less than 
seven years, you ask the children to point to the body parts, naming of the colors. These are simple ways by which you test for comprehension in smaller children. Then in bigger children, you ask for naming of the object and try your level best that you can ask that, okay, what is this? This is mobile. What is this? This is a, a pen. What is this? This is a comb or this is a purse. So ask the child to name common objects that are kept in your pocket most of the time. Look how promptly the child is trying to respond back. That's what is naming per se. Similarly, you look for repetition and one of the best word to use for repetition is Billy Dood Piti Hai. You ask the child to repeat Billy Dood Piti Hai. If the child is able to repeat it very well, the repetition is quite well preserved in this particular child. So that means we tested for fluency, we tested for articulation, we tested for comprehension, we tested for naming, we tested for repetition. The last two functions is reading and writing. Reading, remember that you ask the uh, uh, reading per se, one of the way to do is ask them to read the newspaper, but uh, it might be very difficult for a child to start reading a newspaper per se. So what you generally do is that take a piece of the paper and write touch your nose. Okay, so the child reads that piece of the paper and he touches his nose. That means you ask the child that read what is written here and do what is written in this paper. So if the child is able to read and do what he is able to do, then the reading skills are relatively preserved. Similarly, you can also test for writing where you're asking the child to write his name, father's name, okay, which school do you go? So all these things can be per se commented on. So these are the seven functions of the language that you test for. If there is a predominant problem in articulation, that's a dysarthria. If there is a disturbance in the structure or the organization of the language, that's an aphasia. If the problem is in the voice production due to some local vocal cord pathology like laryngitis, laryngeal nerve palsy, this is dysphonia. Dysphonia doesn't come to a neurologist, it goes to an ENT person. Whereas dysarthria and aphasia might come to you. Remember that in pediatrics, we don't see so much of aphasia, but we see more of dysarthria. The two most common type of dysarthria that we tend to see is what is called called as spastic dysarthria and extrapyramidal dysarthria. We don't tend to see the other dysarthria so commonly the way adult neurologists tends to see. One of the very characteristic of spastic dysarthria is that they will have what is called as Donald Duck kind of uh, speech. So most of these pseudobulbar or these kind of spastic dysarthria, the children usually will have strained kind of the voice. So when I ask the child to say, Achha beta, machli jal ki rani hai, suna ke the child starts saying Ma -ja -li -ja -li. so this is how the child will try to speak this is spastic so it looks as if the child is speaking from the deep of the stomach and the child is giving a strained kind of a voice that's a spastic dysarthria whereas extra pyramidal dysarthria so you can't understand what the child said because all the melody of the voice is totally lost. So you will have what is extra pyramidal dysarthria where emphasis is given everything to the same thing. So the child actually said So that means you didn't understand anything. The first reaction that you often give right? So this is a very, very common thing that you tend to see in extra pyramidal dysarthria in which you will tend to have a monotonous kind of a soft voice but you can't understand what the child is trying to primarily say this is very common in extra pyramidal dysarthria so extra pyramidal dysarthria wherever you are finding extra pyramidal dysarthria you will also get other extra pyramidal signs on motor examination wherever you are getting spastic dysarthria you will get spasticity brisk dtr all these things will be primarily seen in spastic dysarthria per se. So how do I tell it in the exam? I will say that on assessment of spontaneous conversational speech, the auditory semantic comprehension is preserved. The speech is very fluent, provided everything is normal. I will say that there is a good articulation of words with the preserved skills of naming, repetition, reading, writing with absence of 
neologisms and paraphrasia. So just remember very simple thing that there are seven components of language that you should not forget. So till now we have covered appearance, behavior, communication. The two more important things that you tend to notice is delusions, hallucinations, and emotions. This is more, more of noting down rather than, you know, testing something. Suddenly you see that the child starts saying, oh, Sam Bhagya. So then you know that the child is hallucinating. Similarly, if the child was, you know, playing very well and suddenly the child starts having emotional outburst, then you know that this is an emotional outburst which the child is primarily having. So you need to understand that delusions, hallucinations, emotions, all these things needs to be commented on primarily. So these are the mental status examination that is appearance, behavior, communication, delusions, emotion. The next component is higher mental function where we test for consciousness, orientation, memory, abstract thought, attention, perception, insight, and calculation. And all of you remember that consciousness has two main components. First component is wakefulness, that's arousal. The second component is awareness of the self. That's very, very common. Remember that wakefulness is a part of ascending reticular formation, whereas awareness is a part of the cortical function. And we need to remember that awareness cannot occur without the wakefulness. Although the wakefulness can occur with without awareness. So please remember that there are two components of the sensorium assessment. One is wakefulness, another is awareness. If wakefulness is preserved, awareness is preserved, brainstem functions are normal, then you know that the child is conscious. If the wakefulness is preserved, awareness is suboptimal. That means it's not full. Brainstem functions are normal then you call this as minimally conscious state. Remember, in minimally conscious state, the wakefulness is totally preserved. Awareness is suboptimal. It is not complete, right? If wakefulness is preserved, but awareness is undo, zero, nothing, but brainstem functions are preserved. That means the child closes the eyes, open the eyes, but does not respond to anything. Then this is vegetative state. If the same vegetative state is persisting for more than one month, this is called persistent vegetative state. Similarly, if wakefulness is absent, awareness is also absent, but brainstem functions are preserved, then only you call it as coma. We try our level best to avoid other terms like semi-coma, and other terms which are to be better avoided. So it is always a good idea to primarily restrict yourself into one of the four categories wherever it is possible. So when I go to the exam, I would say that the child is sitting comfortably in the couch with spontaneous eye opening, following simple commands of moving the limb with appropriate verbal response. Or if it is a small baby, I will say that the baby is lying comfortably, fixing, following, cries when damp, feeding very well, moving all the four limbs spontaneously. So remember that consciousness, when I'm describing, I'm again using the word called as EMV, but I'm describing EMV rather than trying to use modified GCS. So it is a not a very, very good idea to comment on GCS, which is primarily used for Glasgow Coma Scale or the GCS, which is primarily used by neurosurgeons to test for the sensorium in acute neurosurgical patients. It is better to use certain scores like four scores, which are far more easier to use rather than using GCS per se to say it. So moving on from consciousness to the next part that is consciousness, coma, pi fact, consciousness, orientation. Remember that the orientation is usually tested from time, place, and person, and it is always a good idea to ask the same questions in the time because the mini mental status examination or the MMSC per se will have these sequences only. So you ask the child, what is this year? Ye garmi hai ki sardi hai? Kaun sa mahina chal raha hai? Kya date hai or kya day hai? Is it a Wednesday, Saturday? Which day it is there? Similarly, you can say that which floor you are there? Are you there in the hospital? Which city is it? Which state does it belong to? Which country does it belong to? So this is how you test for place. What is your name? What is your father's name? These are person. And you remember that whenever there is a disorientation, it is the time disorientation that goes off first before place and person 
disorientation comes. And when you're testing for orientation in small babies, which are there, it is possible, not possible to ask them time, place and person. So obviously you will ask for, look for stranger anxiety, familiarity with parents. So these are some of the substitutes for orientation. The next thing after coma PIFAC is consciousness orientation, then we come to memory. Remember that memory has basically three components. So when you're giving a file to a clerk, to your one of your clerk, it is up to the clerk that the clerk decides whether I want to keep this file in my locker or should I throw it away completely. So this is the first stage, which is also called as immediate memory or working memory. So it is like a filing clerk. The second thing is that, okay, then you say that, no, this is an important information. This needs to get go into a cabinet for a recent memory. So recent memory is information that is stored temporarily, right? So this is a short term memory. Remember that immediate memory or the working memory is a part of prefrontal cortex, whereas short term memory is a part of medial temporal lobe. Whereas long-term memory or the neocortex is filing cabinet for remote information. That's a long-term memory. Where did you study long-term memory? So these are neocortical functions which are primarily there. So please try to separate working memory from short-term memory to long-term memory because the localization of each memory part is going to be entirely different. There are multiple ways to test for memory. One of the simple way is to give them three unrelated objects like you can give them chair, you can ask them crow, you can ask them shirt and then ask, uh, you can ask them to repeat what I said immediately. So if the child is able to immediately tell that, oh, you said chair, crow and shirt, all three are unrelated. So this is an immediate memory. I'll ask the child to remember these things and then I will ask you later. When you ask later, this becomes a recent memory which is there. Similarly, you can also show you five objects and one of the ways in which we generally do is naming jab humne language mein test kiya tha, wo jo char objects humne dikhai te, usi ko pooch sakte ho, ki tell me what those four objects were. Right, so that will test your recent memory. So I will show you five objects, ask him to show what it is immediately. That's an immediate memory. And after 10 minutes, where did you go is a recent memory. Similarly, you can also test in bigger children that I'm going to read you a story, listen to it carefully. You can keep on asking questions immediately. And at the same time, you ask him to assimilate the information and ask the um, story a little later. So that becomes a recent memory. So you need to differentiate immediate memory from recent memory. Long term memory, you usually test by which school did you study? What is your father's name, mother's name? How many brothers, sisters do you have? What are their names? What is your class teacher's name? So these are long term memories that are usually tested. I'm repeating, it's a very, very important to remember that a prerequisite for memory testing is that the child has to be attentive and the child has to be cooperative to examination and there should be no deficit in the language. So these are three most important things. So if the child does not have a good attention span, he is not the right person to test for memory. So please be sure that attention span is tested before memory is primarily tested. The child should be cooperative to the examination and there should be no deficit in the language also. So these are three important things to test for memory. And there are multiple ways by which you can test for the attention span. You can ask the child to tell the months of the year, January, February, then ask him to repeat it uh, backward or you can ask them to count uh, up to 100 and then ask him to keep subtracting seven one by one but one of the most common tests that we used to that we use to test is attention span as digit span test. So remember that in digit span test, it's very important to remember that suppose you are asking the child to say 69149, please write it down in the piece of paper and ask the child to say 69149. So don't use this kind of a speed while you're testing for digit span test. So you have to test the attention span. So when you're testing for attention span, spell it out very slowly. So you will tell the child, Dekho, ab tumhe koi number bataunga, dhyan se suno, uske baad repeat karo. Six, nine, 
वन फोर नाइन so do it very slowly so that the child if attention span is good then only the child will be able to tell the digits forward so you can start from three digit and then keep on increasing and note down how many um, digit forward and how many digit backward the child is able to repeat per se in the digit span test generally we expect that a 6 year old child will be able to tell five digit forward and three digit backward and a 10 year old child will be able to tell six digit forward and four digit backward per se so now you can name those three objects that i asked you to remember so it was what was it it was shirt crow and chair so these were the three things so by which you can remember the recent memory so while you are testing for attention span immediate memory you tested after that you went to attention span you can test for short term memories also so you can say that the child is oriented to time place and person has reasonable attention span with intact immediate short term and long term memory so coming from consciousness coma pi fact consciousness orientation memory attention span i am coming to abstract thought perception insight and calculation remember that these are higher cortical functions and these are usually tested in children beyond 8 years of age in smaller children we are often having difficulty in under testing these abstract thoughts so abstract thought is a frontal lobe function you can ask them simple proverbs and ask them to tell the meaning like ghar ki murghi dal barabar so if you can you can ask them these kind of things and ask them to interpret it similarly you can ask them what is common between trouser and jeans then the child will say okay dono niche pehante hain apple banana the child will think and say both of them are fruits so you can ask them what is common what is the difference if the table is to the leg car is to what then the child will think and will say okay you meant tire so analogies differences commonalities these are some of the ways by which you are testing for abstract thought similarly you can ask the child to draw a clock and ask them to Uh, you know write all the digit from 1 to 12 that's how you are testing for spatial perception look whether all the digits are very well clearly pronounced or not so can you can the child draw the clock very clearly so this is spatial perception then you come to what is called as calculation calculations you can start from simple verbal calculations uh, like 2 plus 6 3 minus 1 4 into 6 but one of the best way by which we usually test a calculation is to give them some some kind of analogy like i can say that ki maine tumhe do kele diye aur papa ne tumhe do kele diya to tumhare paas kitne kele ho gaye so i will, the child will say that okay i have four now if i take two from those four how much will be left out the child will say okay four minus two is two so instead of asking them questions like two plus six three minus one try to give them these kind of situations by which the child will be able to do simple additions um, subtraction similarly you can say that if uh, if a laborer gets five rupees for you know uh, working in one factory and the uh, the the laborer gets 30 rupees so how many days did he work so by this you can say that 30 by 5 uh, so he worked for 6 days so this is how you can test for multiplication divisions simple verbal calculations if the child is able to do then only give them complex and written com uh, you know written complex calculations also otherwise you can avoid we generally expect that simple addition a 5 year old child will be able to do simple subtractions a 7 year old child will be do um, multiplication by 8 years and division by 9 years so we generally expect that calculation skills would these are just a rough figures which generally people say that this is how they usually learn per se so remember that frontal lobe function apart from what we have tested we can also ask the child why have you come to this hospital so the child will say i am sick that's that's why i have come to the i'm sorry that's why i have come to the hospital so you can say that this is insight judgment is like you know house on a fire what will you try to do so these are some of the uh, ways by which you can test for your frontal lobe function there are other test also like you know luria graphic test and trail making test which can test for your executive functions now this is also basically also called as 
uh, the color identification test you ask show him the child this color and ask him to identify the color so the child should not be reading this as red the child should be reading identify the color as green so instead of this being read as yellow the child should be able to say that this is red so this is what is disinhibition testing which is primarily an orbito frontal function so even if you don't remember it is perfectly fine but just remember that most of the time we generally use this troop test or it is also called as troop test color test not the word in which he has to do similarly you can ask them like a play kind of a thing go no go test in which if i tap once the child should tap once when i tap twice the child should not tap so it becomes a kind of a game in which if i tap once the child taps if i tap tap once the child also taps but if i tap twice the child should know that i should not be tapping so that's basically a disinhibition function of the frontal lobe that's a orbito frontal lobe which the child will usually tend to have similarly parietal lobe we have already seen for calculation but in addition ideational apraxias and uh, you know right left orientation all these things are also a part of parietal lobe functions similarly finger agnosia in which agnosia uh, see these are two terms where students really get afraid of the terms like apraxia agnosia thankfully we don't see so much of complicated problems in pediatrics but still uh, students should be a little familiar that if it is a learned activity if i know that this is how i am supposed to comb the hair and now everything is okay motor function okay sensory okay my sensorium is okay but i am not able to do a learned activity that's an apraxia similarly i know that this is my right thumb you know this is my right thumb and now the child is if i ask him to show me the right thumb and the child is unable to recognize this right thumb that's an agnosia so please remember that agnosia apraxia all of them are higher cortical functions that we generally test to tend to test but it is trust me it is very difficult to do in pediatrics so even if you do not register all these things it is perfectly fine but do not forget on released reflexes especially in cases of of neurodegenerative diseases in which palmer grass palmo mental reflex all these things will start reappearing towards the end stage of these children so to just to recapitulate very very fastly appearance a b c d e appearance behavior communication delusion and hallucination and emotion coma pifac consciousness orientation memory attention span abstract thought perception insight calculation so these are some of the important ways by which you can primarily remember higher mental function we usually tend to use mini mental status examination or mmsc to per se try to decipher as to um, uh, this thing but mmsc is better used beyond 8 to 9 years of age uh, dr gauri pasi had come up with a pediatric mmsc so in children we can tend to use this pediatric mmsc also but this kind of objective assessment might be required might not be required but if you remember this uh, abcd in coma pifac you might probably not forget the titles under which you are supposed to do higher mental function so from higher mental function quickly in another 10 minutes i will try to cover the most important parts of cranial nerve examination so you know that the cranial nerve examination starts from the first cranial nerve to the 12th cranial nerve the first cranial nerve per se has two components one is called recognition of the smell that yes i am able to smell something and then i am able to recognize yes this is coffee powder that's identification so the child should be able to recognize and identify the smell of the object please remember that try to you know close the eyes and ensure that you are using one point at a time and i have seen many of the people using uh, you know coffee powder when the child would have never you know smelled a coffee powder also so use simple things like you know uh, lux ka sabun toothpaste colgate ka toothpaste something which the child uses every day so use common daily objects for olfactory nerve testing before uh you are testing so ensure that while you are testing you are testing for recognition and identification of the smell when it comes to the second cranial nerve examination the second cranial nerve examination has basically four components one is visual acuity 
the second is color vision the third is field of vision the fourth is fundus examination so these are the four components of the second cranial nerve that you generally tend to test for so visual acuity per se is usually tested by using the rosenbaum pocket vision screening so you usually keep a pocket vision uh, screening which is there and then you ensure that the child is wearing the spectacles when you are testing for the visual acuity um, um, and if the child is unable to read, then only test for finger counting, hand motion. So that means if you have tested for Rosenbaum and the child is able to read the number up to the last line, then you know that you have tested for the near vision. Similarly, if the child is unable to do this Rosenbaum, even the nine five figure the child is unable to do, then you do finger counting at five feet. The child is unable to do, then test for hand motion at two feet. The child is unable to do, then put projection of the rays. That means put a torchlight from the corner. The child is turned, able to turn to the sound, turn to the light, then this is projection of the rays. The, if the projection of rays is also absent, then test for <coughs> perception of the light. That is where you um, suddenly switch on the light in front of the child and the child blinks immediately. So that's perception of the light. If the child is unable to even have perception of the light, then only you will what use what is called as Mines reflex in which you will keep the hand, you will introduce the finger suddenly in front of the eyes. The child blinks and removes the face, then you know that the vision is relatively quite okay. So when you're testing for the visual acuity, test for the visual acuity in this kind of a sequence. Similarly, when you're testing for the field of the vision in children, the field vision testing, generally people say that you try to see finger counting. So when you try to do this kind of finger counting instruction to the child, the child will often start jumping and say, ha, ungli dik gai, ungli dik gai. Tumne ungli so instead of that you can probably use a kind of a toy in which you don't give any instruction to the child you just give the instruction to the child to keep looking at your face and introduce the toy one by one from one angle when the child immediately looks at the toy then you know that you are also able to see the child is able to see then you know that the field of the vision is preserved in that particular quadrant per se so try to test for this kind of confrontation testing in small children the Third component is what is called as the color vision by which we test by Ishihara card. Remember that all of you do not have Ishihara card, but all of you have mobile phone. You can open the Google Play Store and download these Ishihara color blindness testing, and then you can test color blindness Ishihara card using these testing. So please do not use any other shortcut method to test for color vision. There is no shortcut to testing color vision except for Ishiara cards. The fourth component of the second cranial nerve is the fundus examination. Um, ensure that you're commenting on the retinal vessels, optic disc, macula, and if there are any obvious findings per se. So please do not remember, please do not forget uh, the components of the second cranial nerve. Components are visual acuity, field of vision, color vision, fundus examination. So these are the four components of the second cranial nerve. Similarly, when you come to the third, fourth, and the sixth cranial nerve, you're looking for certain important things. The first important thing is what is called as alignment of the eyes. You're looking whether there is any squint or it is not a squint. If it is a squint, the most important thing is, is it a paralytic squint or is it a concomitant squint? Then look at the nystagmus of the eyes, look at the ptosis, look at saccadic eye movement, and look at pursue eye movement. Saccadic eye movement is tested by wingling one finger at a time, and the child looks at one particular position. This is saccadic eye movement. Pursue eye movement is when you're moving the finger and the child is following that finger, that's a pursue eye movement. The last component of third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve is pupillary size and reaction. Do not forget the direct consensual and accommodation reflex. Remember to differentiate latent squint from um, manifest squint and cover and cover test is very useful to differentiate between the two. Paralytic and concomitant squint, remember that suppose I have a right-sided sixth nerve palsy, I will not be able to move my right eye. When I ask the child to look at the right side, the right eye will not move, the left eye will move. 
the diploplia will happen in the direction of paralysis. That means if the child is looking on the left, there will be no diploplia. But if the child is looking on the right, in the side of the paralysis, there will be a diploplia which will be massive. So that's a Con, that's a paralytic squint which is there. So do not forget on testing for saccadic eye movements and smooth pursue eye movements. Remember that whenever you're testing for smooth pursue eye movements, you usually use a figure of H which is there. And in unconscious children, you might have to use doll's eye response. In comatose to children or in children who are less than three months, you might use doll's eye response to look for extraocular movement. Do not forget on pupillary size. So six components of three four and six one the most important is what is the squint whether it is there or not nystagmus ptosis which is there then comment on saccadic eye movement comment on pursue eye movements and comment on pupillary size and reaction so six components in three four and six do not forget the titles under which you are supposed to say for example in this child i will say that the right eye is deviated medially suggestive of right esotropia we use the word eso for medial exo for lateral so this is right sided esotropia and conjugate monoocular movements were totally complete with no restriction of extraocular movement. So when there is no restriction of extraocular movement, this is not a paralytic squint. This is a concomitant squint, which you tend to see. So especially in many children with developmental delay and cerebral palsy, you tend to see this concomitant squint rather than paralytic squint per se. Now, when it comes to the fifth cranial nerve, jaw deviation, motor part has to be tested. Sensory part, you test for sensation over the face. Similarly, one reflex. So one motor, one sensory, one reflex. So jaw deviation, sensation, corneal reflex. So do not forget the three components of the the fifth cranial nerve. Many of the times, I'm. Uh, you might actually uh, think why I'm trying to stress on the component. It's very, very important not to miss the components. Most of the time, when a uh, postgraduate resident comes to present the cases, wo aade se zada points waha ho jata hai. So, they don't remember that which title under which we were they were supposed to say. So, do not forget the titles the most important detail is second, but do not forget the title under which you're supposed to say these uh, things. So come, come, comment on the motor part, test for the muscles of mastication, move the jaw to the opposite side. Similarly, test for the reflexes and test for the sensation over the face. When it comes to the seventh cranial nerve, test for facial symmetry and taste sensation. So test for facial symmetry and you know to you should be able to differentiate an upper motor neuron type of a facial palsy from LMN. So LMN is going to involve both upper face and lower face whereas UMN is going to uh, spare the upper faces less affected in these children. Bell's phenomena is very, very common. That's very, very common in children with LMN facial palsy. You can test for test from taste from the anterior two-third of the tongue per se. In the eighth cranial nerve, you test for hearing and uh, using the tuning for test. Remember that hearing test is very, very important that when you're testing for hearing in small infants, you distract the child by you know uh, keeping one kind of a toy and from behind bring one ring if the child is going to turn immediately then you know that the hearing is preserved similarly in bigger children you can give them some whispered instruction and then you can say touch touch so then he understands that what instruction you gave by whisper, the child is able to follow it hear it and then the child is able to do it this is preserved hearing so this is how you are testing for hearing please remember that if hearing test is impaired, then only you go ahead to test for Rene and Weber test. Do not comment on Rene Weber when hearing is totally preserved. Now, coming quickly to the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th cranial nerve, um, do not forget on uh, movement of the palate, uvula, and gag reflex. Uh, 9th, 10th, as far as possible, try to avoid you know, core examination of it, try to look for the pitch of the voice, any nasal twang, it is there or not, any difficulty in swallowing, how is the gag reflex? So try to avoid gag reflex testing as much as possible. If the child is able to drink the milk very well, that there is no nasal regurgitation of the feed, you know, the child is otherwise totally fine, then don't test for gag reflex. Gag reflex 
usually children get really very irritated unless and until you are a very big expert and the child is extremely cooperative taste a sensation from posterior one third of tongue is very very difficult to say no examiner will kill you if you say that yes the child was feeding well i i observed the feeding and did not observe any nasal regurgitation of the feed i can presume that you know ninth tenth is preserved instead of putting one you know spatula within the mouth of the child and then the child will give one tight slap to you after that it is the child is going to completely lose the cooperation for everything so avoid or defer gag reflex testing as much as possible unless and until it is very very mandatory as in cases of children with multiple cranial nerve palsy you have to test gbs children you have to test there is no you know second thought about it so these are some of the important things so similarly 11th cranial nerve test for one sternocleidomastoid test for both the sternocleidomastoid similarly you can test for the strength of the trapezius muscle in the 12th cranial nerve you look for the surface of the tongue look at the fasciculation ask the child to protrude retract the tongue check for any myotonia which is per se there so to just quickly summarize the olfactory nerve you are testing for perception and identification second cranial nerve is visual acuity color vision field of vision fundus examination in the third fourth and sixth cranial nerve you are testing for alignment of eyes nystagmus ptosis conjugate eye movements pupillary size do not forget on the reactions including direct consensual and accommodation reflex similarly in the fifth one motor one sensory one reflex so do not forget fifth cranial nerve similarly seventh cranial nerve you are commenting on facial symmetry and taste sensation eighth cranial nerve you are testing for hearing testing and tuning fork testing if there is an hearing impairment similarly ninth and tenth comment on the voice movement of the palate and uvula before you test for gag reflex 11th do not forget the function of sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle and 12th cranial nerve you are testing for tongue deviation of the tongue and fasciculation so these were the two important messages that i wanted to give to all of you is a b c d e coma pifac appearance behavior communication delusion emotion consciousness orientation memory attention span abstract thought spatial perception insight fund of information and calculation so these are coma pifac and similarly cranial nerves you remember that there are four components of second cranial nerve and six components of third fourth and sixth cranial nerve please do not forget these components while you are testing for the cranial nerve examination so you can find detailed uh, lecture of almost uh, everything on higher mental function cranial nerve motor system um, in this digi nerve app that has been created by dr piyush gupta so we have contributed to almost around 10 lectures and we have also demonstrated it on patients so students might find it a little useful and uh, this is a textbook written by me this is a very simple textbook by uh, which you might find it very useful to understand a very broad neurological approach to most of the time time and there is a resident corner in which uh, how to present cases of cerebral palsy tbm i have tried to cover so you might find this very useful and with this i thank aop for giving this opportunity to um, share my views on it and i thank everyone thank you thank you dr jaya sankar hello yeah thank you dr jaya it's a really excellent talk everything was very uh, crystal clear though i was the chair person but but uh, many things i i came to learn from you today and a very important thing for the pgs ki how to test the higher mental function how to test the cranial nerves and what should be the headings of the examination because during the presentation pgs are moving here and there sometimes they jump up to that area jump up to that area sometimes examiners are coming from other side you have not uh, tested uh, this first first you have to test this then you have to test this but it was very crystal clear in what heading we should examine the child we should present the case and very important during the examination of cranial nerve people are confused with the half one and half syndrome half syndrome but it was very uh, clear ki third fourth sixth in what heading it should be examined and second important thing was about ninth and tenth cranial nerve ki if child is able to eat and child is able to speak there is no nasal relaxation then you don't have to test for gag reflex 
it's excellent sir excellent any question thank you for your kind comments sir thank you so much hello i am audible dr jay uh, yeah yeah for yeah. uh, i congratulate you for a nice excellent talk on your examination just i have one or two queries one query is that how we are going to examine a cns part in a case of unconscious child or there are some developmental competency which may affect the examination of cns so just two points you highlight these two things uh, thank you sir i think uh, uh, examination of an unconscious child is altogether a different topic per se yes. and uh, we will have to have a separate talk on that because <laughs> we cannot exactly fit everything into this but yes the comp because most of the components that we discussed are for conscious children yes. so examination of unconscious child will be an entirely different uh, part which is there Uh, addressing the second question of developmental delay and uh, children with intellectual disability yes many of the time the higher mental functions cannot be precisely estimated but whatever can be estimated can be told to the parents like uh, to the examiner like consciousness can be tested the child the student can say the orientation the child was not cooperative the uh, memory can be a uh, memory could not be tested attention span i attempted but the child was able to do so depending upon the variable intelligence which is there uh, the child might respond might not respond so it becomes very challenging to um, examine higher mental function in children with intellectual disability thank you thank you for your comments oh, how is you open for question any questions basically they are asking for your presentation and sir already has told ki this is on the app dg app so you can uh, see the presentation in the dg app also and a very good book written by the dr jaya you can purchase that book and you can uh, 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 you have the mail id you have the uh, phone number you can ask the question to dr jaya thank you dr jaya shankar ji uh, really i think uh, this is uh, sir one question if you permit hello thank you dr jay shankar ji that was really a talk which is worth remembering worth uh, repeating so all the students who have attended it they also want to uh, listen to it to view it again and again and for their benefit uh, we'll try to upload it on the youtube channel of course a diginov app your textbook which is written for the neurology uh they can uh, visit that they can purchase that and read it but it was uh, such a pleasure and such a means and formation and such a knowledgeable thing to hear you hear you uh, and view you your talk uh, face to face i think everyone who was a uh, witness to this talk was really really benefited and will remember this forever and we'll have our next uh, second part coming of it on the 5th of uh, august and i really thank dr jayashankar for sparing this time for all of us uh, preparing and presenting in a, such a nice manner for the benefit of the post graduates and this has given our teaching uh, means a, a new height and i think we will all the post graduates i hope they will be extremely enjoying this thing and relishing it and uh, uh, we'll hope to see you next time uh, next uh, week on the 5th of august thank you dr sunil rao you, and dr yashwant rao sir for giving the valuable you, time and it is thank indeed you, a sir. pleasure and honor to have you as our chairperson thank you all the viewers all the post graduates the faculty members who have joined and spared the time i hope it's all worth it i will try to keep it on uh, the standards higher again uh, from the time to come thank you all